So I'm teaching two different sections of, it's called Art 141, and it's a, it's a 2D design class. And the name is actually Surface Space Time. So we cover those principles and elements of 2D design in the class. And this semester with the COVID-19 situation and um, everything that's going on with the climate crisis and the ongoing um, involvement with the EcoArts project, because um, I, I worked with students last semester as well on, on, um, on this project for Bigelow Labs. And um, so I decided that I would just sort of throw everything out that I normally do. And by that, I mean just the normal assignments. Um, I'll still be covering the same elements and principles of design in the class, but we're gonna do so by um, looking at the theme of uh, the eco, you know, looking at the eco arts project and then sort of honing in on plankton imagery. Uh, as our contribution to the project. So basically for the entire semester, the students are studying uh, common main plankton and phytoplankton. And uh, our first thing, you know, one of the things that we've looked at is the tiny giant slideshow that was provided through Anna by, you know, by Bigelow Labs. And um, it's, it's a fairly straightforward thing we're doing right now. We're using the, the actual imagery as a um, structure or substrate to um, apply different color uh, combinations. So we're studying color theory. And uh, like we've gone over things like the terms abstraction and non-objective and looked at artists like um, Matisse and, and the um, you know, Impressionist and uh, Fauve painters and things like that. So uh, thinking about the idea of you can take something as a point of departure as in a plankton image and colorize it in different ways um, so that you're not being sort of true to naturalistic color, but you're kind of opening, up, opening it up to interpretation. And, okay. and also as a way to study color theory. So that's what we're doing so far. And as the, and then, you know, these are hand painted with gouache and then we've gone into the computer lab and uh, extracted some of the images from the painted gouache pieces and manipulated them using a free software program called GIMP. And that's kind of the uh, free um, open source version of Photoshop. And so, I think they did really well with that. And, and then we got a color guide um, for the exhibition, which is gonna be really helpful because we can actually use the CMYK codes to you know, get the actual colors that are being used um, or sample colors from that, um, the palette there. And so as we move uh, more into the semester, I'm gonna, you know, the assignments will open up a little more for them to, um, uh, be um, experiment with some different kinds of ideas and also work with this color palette more. Um, so uh, after meeting with Anna and Chris, the exhibition designer, um, a lot of ideas came up about how these kinds of plankton images and patterns could be integrated with the exhibition through different printmaking techniques. So I'm excited about that. The students seem to be excited about it. And, um, you know, the more information we can feed them about ocean studies and plankton and climate change and um, with um, your work, Carter, you know, to expose them to different, what different artists are doing, um, the more we can do that way it, it, it is the better. So Jan, that's great what you're saying. I think there'll be um, a lot of overlaps with the work that I'll share, um, particularly with, with the work I've done with Bigelow um, and how I've done a similar thing to what you're doing with your class where you're sort of taking you know, science-inspired imagery. Um, in my case, it's a little bit more uh, down the line. It's not so directly like phytoplankton or diatoms um, and sort of non-objectifying them um, adding my own color and so on and so forth. So um, this is great. Uh, I, by the way, I'm Carter Shappy. Um, 
I'm a visual artist, printmaker, um, art handler, a little bit of everything here and there. Um, I graduated from Maine College of Art in 2015, and I've been here in Portland uh, working ever since. Um, just a little bit of my background prior to that, I was a, I was a, uh, um, graduated high school and uh, ended up at community college because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do um, and took my time to figure out that it was art that I wanted to pursue. So ended up taking about a year and a half at community college and then transferring to Mecca and uh, finding printmaking there and falling in love with printmaking and uh, pursuing that all the way through. So I am still doing that today, mostly for my, my fine art work. Um, and so when I, when I graduated, uh, the question became, became, what do I want to do with this? You know, what, what pursuit do I want to take? Um, and one of the ideas that I'd come up with was that I wanted to collaborate with um, people outside the realm of visual art, directly outside the realm of visual art. So, you know, I loved working with artists for about four years in art school, and I loved working with art professors and so on and so forth. But I was really interested in um, ways that I could draw connections between kind of disparate, seemingly disparate um, fields. And one of those, which I've always been fascinated by and always been kind of an enthusiast of, is the world of science. So I, uh, I discovered Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences um, through some connections. And I ended up, long story short, reaching out to them and very loosely writing them a proposal and just saying, hey, look, this is what I do. Um, I love what you guys do. I did a little bit of research on them and, and learning that they do you know, all sorts of research in microbiology, ocean microbiology. Um, and uh, they got back to me and they said, this is great. We, we've been looking for an artist in residence um, to kind of do a collaborative project with and, and share some of our research in a different way. And so that kicked it off and we spent about four months together, uh, I worked specifically with, with uh, Dr. Steve Archer, who's one of their senior research scientists, and um, one of his research technicians, Carlton Rauschenberg. Um, so I spent four months there, and I, our day-to-day -day was basically all over the place, but I would shadow them, um, sometimes in the laboratory with them, sometimes with uh, you know, their, their, um, their PhD students, um, postdoc students, uh, and just kind of observing their daily routines as scientists, as research scientists. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the in my microscopy uh, labs, so looking through microscopes of all sorts, which is, as an artist, I think really, really fascinating. Uh, it's kind of this weird tunnel vision experience. I think there were a couple of days where I spent, uh, you know, a full day, a full six hours staring through microscopes, which is a very, very cool experience. Um, and uh, also just chatting. There was a lot of just talking about what I do, what they do, um, and exploring the overlaps and uh, really me asking a ton of questions because I'm not, you know, my, my level of science education is, is not that of a, a research scientist, of course, so, which was really wonderful. And in the end, um, we came together, the three of us, uh, also with input from, from several others, and we we uh, designed the piece that's still there um, that'll be coming down next year when we work on the eco arts project um, called Color Cosm. Uh, I'll scroll you through. This is this is the Bigelow project. This is what I was just chatting about, and this piece right here is the final product. This is Color Cosm, and it's both day and night. Um, scroll through, through some of these images a bit. has this really fantastic lighting at night, totally changes the piece, becomes almost like a different piece. And some day shots as well. So this is made of uh, a, a sanded like graphics plastic that's meant particularly for printing on. Um, there's a lot of plastic that they use, uh, interestingly, in their work because it's a durable material. Uh, and, and overall, the piece borrows its shape from, if I can do this really quickly. Well, let's see here. This is good, okay. 
So this is a, this is, if you can see this device here, oops, sorry. This is sort of what a, meso a mesocosm looks like. And this is an experimental water enclosure device um, that's commonly used out in the field for some of the research that Steve was working on. Um, and essentially what it is, is a long tube, a long like cylindrical shaft that's, uh, it's a flexible um, impermeable membrane that's suspended in open ocean water. So they're um, sometimes a hundred plus feet long. They're, they're massive. They're lowered into the water and they're held up by these buoyancy structures on the top. So they, they kind of hang there while the bottom is suspended and um, open air can get to the surface. So it kind of imitates a little sliver of water column um, as it is in open ocean. So it's, it's both experimental and kind of field research. And uh, what they are able to do is manipulate certain conditions in the water in that partic particular sliver of, of uh, water that they've you know, kind of sectioned off. And in this case with, with Dr. Steve Archer, they were um, basically, they were increasing the acidity uh, to projected ocean acidity levels um, as the ocean keeps getting more acidic, which we know is happening and seeing how the biology responds. And, and even more so in this case, they were looking at uh, how the phytoplankton and other uh, smaller, even microscopic uh, organisms respond to this ocean acidity. And even more to that, they were looking at this particular gas that they produce um, called uh, dimethyl sulfide and um, seeing how this increased acidity affects their production of that gas. And um, that gas is special because it's a constant exchange between the life in the ocean and the atmosphere. And what it does is it has a uh, overall net cooling effect on the planet. It helps produce cloud coverage that um, reflects heat back into space. And so, of course, what they're finding is with many of these issues of climate change is that they're very compounded, they ripple out through everything and they have these wild, unforeseeable um, until now effects. And um, of course, the increased acidity significantly reduced the production of this gas, therefore reducing the, um, ultimately having a net negative um, impact on, on, cool, on cooling. So basically the heating is compounded. It's getting, it's getting worse through ocean acidity, not just um, other things like uh, ozone and, and so on and so forth, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases. So that's the overall shape. And really the way that I approached this process and how I, um, how I wanted to relay some of the things that we talked about, some of the things that I learned there was very much in a, in a sort of tangential way. Um, I, I, I'm not a direct person when it comes to my work. I've always worked in the wor world of abstraction um, I like this idea that if something isn't so uh, obvious, if we don't know what we're quite, what quite we're looking at, um, then we're encouraged to ask more questions. And in this case, I think that's kind of the basis of, for me, of making art and also scientific discovery. It's, it's very much fundamental to those two things. So that's why I stuck with this overall theme of abstraction through pattern and color. And you'll notice um, the rings, these are sort of like, cylindrical rings here that this piece is cut up into um, their different colors and that correlates to uh, basically light the light spectrum and how it how it is absorbed at different um, depths of the ocean so the warmer spectrums are absorbed first towards the surface and then as you go down um, of course blue and and uh, that um, violet being the the deepest penetrating uh, wavelengths which is one of the reason I'm told that um, it is an overwhelmingly blue experience for us to look at the ocean in general. Um, also, the spacing of these um, is very much intentional. So as you move from the bottom, from the blue up to the red, the space between each ring gets greater. Um, and that is uh, sort of to point to this exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere that, that um, Steve and his team 
we're constantly exploring. And it's something that I didn't, I, I was aware of with, with, with water cycles and so on and so forth. But to the extent that different, the different molecules are constantly being exchanged, both uh, by life and not uh, between the ocean and the atmosphere is really, it's really important. And it's, it's perpetually happening. And it's re this really beautiful thing. So I wanted the piece to sort of lighten up as you move to the top to point to this kind of exchange and this shift from, from heaviness of the ocean to this kind of airiness of the atmosphere. So that's color cosm. That's still there, like I said, and, and uh, that will be there until next year when we put up the Eco Arts Project, which is a great place to, to chat about really quickly. Um, so Anna and I met, uh, I don't know, beginning of this year or not long ago. And uh, she asked me to be a part of the team um, to uh, basically assist and help design the um, overall infrastructure for installing and um, hanging all of the artworks that are going to be made for this project. So that's another ex background that I, I have dabbled in for a while now is art handling or preparator work where you're you know, either designing installation um, layouts or installation systems, or you're just handling and installing artworks. Um, so for that project, we're working right now to kind of work with the artists involved um, and the student work everybody's working on right now um, to uh, make a layout uh, and also design a system for hanging these artworks which is really, really wonderful. It's a great product to be a part of and um, has a really nice collaborative nature, which similar to the project I did with Big Lil previously, I found that I've gravitated towards quite a bit, so. Um, some other work. Can we, um, I have a couple of yeah. questions before. Yeah, please uh, dive in. Yeah, um, so, um, oh, first of all, I was just talking to a student of mine yesterday who is a scuba diver. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about the different layers of color as you go down deeper into the ocean. And uh, this was just yesterday. So, uh, you know, I'd love to share your work with her because I think she'd really, really appreciate it um, since she has this kind of experience of actually you know, seeing that. Yeah. And um, then the questions were, in what sort of printmaking technique are you using? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sorry, I glazed right over that. Uh, all right, I was just curious. There, um, the whole piece was uh, flat layers originally, and then they were seamed together to make rings, uh, but they were screen printed. So a lot of, that's a big part of my work in general, screen printing, because it has a kind of an efficiency to it. It's, it's somewhat of a quick process, but in that you can work very modularly and with layers very quickly. So, um, also, I skipped over the imagery on these rings is, um, so everything's screen printing, but the imagery is digitally extracted using Photoshop um, from images that I took um, while using their scanning electron microscope. So, okay, I was wondering about that as yeah, well. That was my yeah. other question. Sorry, there's so much information that goes in this piece that it's sometimes it's like, it's uh, hard to get it all. But yeah, so... And, and even to more to that there, um, the images that I took with the SEM um, were of things, materials that I use commonly and also materials that Steve uses commonly in his lab and in my studio. So we talked a lot about being that he worked with ocean acidification at the process of etching, which is also something that's um, another scientist is working on there, which is, uh, um, was studying sort of the, the effect of increased acidity on shell bearing creatures. So calcium carbonate structures in the ocean, which are essentially etched over time, they reduce their structural integrity and they become more fragile. And, and so we, we were correlating that to as is a, an artist thing to do. We were correlating, correlating that to, you know, my own work in uh, with copper etching and, and working with acids on a, a common, common basis. Um, and so some of the images we took on the SEM were of like really tiny fragments of etched copper that were from these ex super etched plates that I did where I would leave them um, in the acid for like several days and they would kind of turn into very small fragments. Mm. 
So they had these, they created these really beautiful spaces, which I'll show you. Yeah, that's a great parallel between your, your own process and the, the kind of etching that goes on in the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think um, it was really great that, that they were able to, like, entertain these, these kind of parallels. Um, they're not, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a magical uh, free thinking association that I've done as an artist, but there was a really interesting overlap that I just couldn't help but explore. So, and also using that S the scanning electron microscope was by far one of the most interesting things that I did. I, yeah. I got, it's a very frustrating machine to control. It's kind of like when you're having a dream and you're trying to run, you know, those dreams, but you're on a treadmill kind of thing. It's very, it's very much like that. It's, you're constantly refining these dials and like trying to get a better image um, cause you can sort of see on a, on a, on a little screen, what you're doing as you're, um, basically firing electrons at a, um, a gold coated sample of something. In my case, it was copper. Um, and really quickly, actually in the case of the copper, I didn't coat it with gold because it was already a metallic surface. So it was able to bounce back those electrons, but because I didn't coat it with gold, which is the standard for imaging, um, you get all this organic material that's on these samples that will actually cause the electrons to what they call flare up or charge up as they hit your sample and bounce back to the sensors. So that's what creates these little hot spots here that you see in these images. Um, and, it, and I loved that. I actually ended up really liking that. It created this kind of theatrical lighting and these, these ended up being very like otherworldly uh, kind of cosmic scenes. So, um, there, there, that was fascinating. So what I did with the, with the screen printing was I basically came in here and I pulled out, I pulled out solid shapes that I could use um, very modularly and similar to the way that you're using the, the phytoplankton and mm -hmm. diatoms and other things with your class. Uh, so I could use those in my, in, in the larger piece and create like a textural component to it. Yeah. Let's go back to my homepage here. Um, so just really quickly, I won't dive into this too much, but just to, to let, you know, people know where, where some of these ideas also fit in with the larger context of my work. This was a piece that I did for my undergraduate thesis, which is very much, I mean, coincidentally, because as you've heard, most of the stuff I did for Bigelow, that piece, Color Cosm, was very much inspired by the work they were doing here. But this shape is a reoccurring theme for me. So this is called the spiral. This is a piece that I did. Um, for my thesis, for my undergrad thesis. Um, and it, it, interesting enough, it has that similar shape, but it has nothing to do with any of that research. And this was using um, screen printing again. Uh, and this was kind of the capstone of a large body of work that I called the Ghost Gear series. And I still actually work on it sometimes. Um, and it's using uh, basically collected, found, fishing industry waste that washes up in the beaches, but also other um, littered plastics and, and things like that, films, bags, um, but mostly rope, bait bags, net, um, all this fishing industry waste. It's really, really common here in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and basically, I don't know if you're, Dan, have your students done any screen printing? Uh, they, they- Prior, Maybe some of them. Maybe some of them have, um, but I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, some of them are, they're not all art students. It's a, it's a, also, a, it's a uh, sort of a creative expression class for the core curriculum at USM. And okay. then, you know, so there are some art students though, and, and, but this is one of the foundation courses. So it's a beginning course, but a lot of them have maybe, you know, they have experience from high school. So uh, the short answer is I'm not sure. Okay. Well, I'll just uh, really quickly screen printing is like, uh, and actually like, this is great. I can kind of show you it. Um, it utilizes big screens. This is a screen. It's just a mono, basically like a monofilament uh, mesh that's stretched, that's stretched taut over a frame. And uh, in some way, a, um, a stencil is made into that screen where there's open mesh and there's blocked mesh and you basically squeegee ink through that to create an image. And so for this, this work particularly, you, you know, traditionally you would use a film of sorts, like a film positive. If you're, if anybody's a photographer and has a photography, 
We know that you use film negatives. In this case, you use film positives. Basically, it's just your image um, on a transparency, like an overhead transparency, if you think of it like that. But in this case, I actually use the materials um, as a film positive. So I'm getting this perfect silhouette of these materials, however I want to arrange them layer by layer. And so that's how these are printed, um, similar to a lot of my work and very much a, a building up of layers. Uh, and um, I'm still working on this, this, this work. I have a couple pieces in my studio currently. I can get out of the way. There's a large piece right there. Um, so really quickly, uh, basically you would coat a screen, very thin layer of uh, what we call photo emulsion, emulsion. I'm terrible at saying that word for some reason. Um, and uh, you let it dry. It's a light sensitive coating. And then you would uh, basically have your screen and you'd put your materials flat up against the face of the screen and you would shoot light at the front of the screen or the, the sorry, the face and where your materials were in my case, my materials or your film positive would basically block out the light from hitting that coating um, only in those areas. And then what else, what else, whatever wasn't blocked out by the light turns hard, it hardens essentially. So then you wash it out, wash out the unhardened image area with a, with a hose or, or you know, um, power washer. And then you have open mesh and you're just basically squeegeeing ink through um, with, the, with the squeegee. Um, I know that's, that's kind of hard to imagine without having visuals, but um, if you- It's if clear, it's, it's great that you, you know, for you to go over the print, printmaking process. And, and, the and, and another process. question, is, is this, sorry to interrupt, but is, is, is this, is this the, the same support you use for the, for the uh, um, Bigelow project, the, the same material? This, dome, or this, uh, this donut here? No, uh, this, is, this is different. This is different because this has a little, um, and actually it's refined for the Bigelow one. I made it, it's a little bit more interesting and, and visually appealing, I think. This has like a slight um, contour that's cut into it so that the spiral can start itself. <laughs> you can slide the material up into this. Uh, and for Bigelow, which I think you can see in one of the images, the, the hole where the light comes through is like tiered with different uh, circles. So it has this like um, concentric circle that are stepped up almost like a lens or an aperture. Um, and this isn't as refined as that, this, you know, undergrad. Is but, that an LED light or? Yeah, so it's, a, it's just a classic like up, up what they call up lights in the industry or okay yeah yeah um and for this it was for this piece it was color changing so it was on a timer and it switched colors every so often oh cool and um for bigelow it's a, a, a uv uh violet uh, mm. specifically a uv violet it's not pure uv but it's like a uv it's violet more on the uv wavelength side um and that was the only the choice for that was purely because I use UV light a lot, all, and also because for Bigelow for the color cosm piece, it didn't desaturate the colors that I had printed. So that's one of the issues that can happen is if, if oh you, right, you know, if you have uh, right green something that's green isn't really it's it's reflecting green light, it's absorbing red light. So if I was to you know shoot um, a bunch of red light at it, only red light, it would completely desaturate it and it would look completely different. That's kind of a weird thing about light. And, and yes. uh, another weird parallel because I spend a lot of time in red light because it's a safe light that doesn't, ex it doesn't um, harden uh, a lot of the printmaker photo sensitive materials that we use, similar to photographers. Mm. Hmm. There's so much information, I'm sorry. So at any point, keep asking questions, this is great. It's very helpful. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, lastly, jump into some, some newer work, which is a little bit more similar to Bigelow. It's a little bit more science inspired. Um, not so much in the world of, 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 well, sort of in the world of biology as well. It's kind of everywhere, but, um, this is work that I call viscosity monotypes. And that's a made up, that's a me made up term, uh, mostly talking about a process that I've started working with a number of years ago and have been trying to refine for for a while now. Um, so if you can see here, 
and it sometimes I love the colors on, on that yeah on those, the combination and the color just the individual colors are great yeah they're beautiful so what these started out as and i have some examples here and they will be hard to see because they're very intricate but so what these started out was this is a plexi plate you can see and it's gonna be hard to see the the patterning it, you won't be able to see it on this one but um they started out as plexi plates Basically, a number of years ago, I had made a mistake. I was printing a copper plate, and the back of it got covered in a ton of ink. And um, you know, when you're printing copper plates, you're printing on a printing press with a ton of pressure. And uh, you know, to my surprise, I flipped over the, the plate after I was done printing it. Um, there was an image on the front, and the back was covered again, covered in ink. And uh, but it had produced these really intricate branching patterns that I had seen before, and they resembled some, some other areas of interest of mine, um, mainly fra fractals. And so from there on, I'd set out trying to refine that and control that uh, more in a way that I could use it to make imagery um, and not just by mistake. Um, so it started with plexi plates where I was basically dolloping ink onto plate and you know exerting pressure, um, two plates, mind you, pressed together with, with ink between and you can do this very simply, um, just take two plexiglass plates, put a piece of acrylic, dollop of acrylic ink in there and press it together mm. um, with a good amount of force and then separate them. And regardless of the amount of force that you use, you will see some type of branching structure emerge. And this is uh, in the world of physics, um, the, the process is called viscous fingering. And uh, I mean, it has so many applications in the world of science and, uh, and industries in general too. Um, and so, uh, I've been pushing that a bit further than kind of that rudimentary experiment and have created a, a process where I can control the shape, the overall shape of these, but also how these patterns, these branching patterns form and the density they form at, uh, or the detail and also creating some kind of depth of them. There's almost like a continuous tone to them. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's what I'll, I'll show you some examples really quickly, um, not just on the website here, but well, actually, first I'll walk through this website and I'll stop screen sharing. But um, so these are like the, these are cutouts. Basically, they're images that I've scanned in, but they're um, it's these printing process. It's done on a board, a special board that I use now. And then I hand cut all of these out. Wow. And um, they're like these floating puzzle piece shapes. Um, and uh, I've done them in a number of arrangements. These ones are digital. So I'll take this one layer, I'll scan it in and then I'll mess with it digitally and do these like fun, um, kind of like portal, like, uh, imagery. Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, to more to that point, uh, this was one of the first pressings that I did. One of the first monotypes that I did. I scanned it in and then I was noticing that I loved these, these, um, we can zoom in here. I loved these shapes. There's all these little fine shapes in here that um, make up a greater whole. And that's one of the principles of fractals in general is that there is a, the, this element of self similarity, which they call. And basically in this case, the branching patterns are, um, similar at a, they're sort of infinitely scalable. So you have the same kind of shapes at a small scale, and then those smaller scales creating the same shape, so on and so forth. And you can scale out infinitely. That's the idea with, with fractals in general. Yeah. And, and so I started. Self-similar, but they don't repeat themselves. Right. Exactly. Right. And there's just like infinite nuance and complexity. And, um, and so I started extracting these shapes um, and creating little characters out of them, which is some newer work that's in process where I'll take a, a, an image and uh, I'll kind of create a narrative for it through titling and talking about the work. This piece is called the elder. And then I'm creating these smaller characters that make up these uh, larger images. Mm -hmm. And so just to show you, these are, um, this is one of the shapes. So it's cut out and it's on this, um, basically it's like gesso board that I treat with a special coating and then I paint the edges. Um, and they're like these great little puzzle pieces. And uh, that's a 
in progress uh, body of work that I'm hoping to finish this year. I have like hundreds of these now and um, they will likely make up a large um, wall installation, kind of a specific arrangement of sorts. But the interesting point about that is that um, this imagery is, and, and why I'm so interested in it is it's ubiquitous. It's throughout everything. I mean, it's um, it's the river deltas, the mountain ranges from satellite imagery that we see. It's uh, plant growth, whether that be um, you know kind of the veins on leaves or trees, root systems, mycelium. It's um, the way that on a smaller scale, when you're at the beach, that water as the tide goes out moves through the sand and leaves those beautiful little branching patterns. Um, again, it's just, it's, it's one of the common languages of growth and movement in the natural world. So that's why I'm very much drawn to it. 